Hi, I'm Dan Schmidt. I do a weekly television show called Team Chicago Challenge. My website is teamchicago.tv, teamchicago.tv. Uh, if you want to contact me, my email is teamdan45 at gmail.com. We are on the west side of Chicago, the near west side. We're at 1341 West Randolph. I believe this is the Plumbers Union parking lot. The Plumbers Hall is right here. The big flea market, market open market for uh, people in Chicago. And they invited vintage motorcycles to come and uh, and so that people are exposed to great looking motorcycles. So we're gonna to talk to some of the people here, look at some of the bikes, and um, I think this could be a pretty good clip on YouTube. And don't forget my email, teamdan45 at gmail.com, and let me know what you think of this clip and this show in Chicago. The Randolph Street Market is a monthly event. You have to apply online it's for artists, artisans, craftsmen. They are very selective who comes and sells at this near West Side Market. A good number of bands were there. It looks like it's a great time inside and outside. Now we're looking at Mark Latte and he has got this 1922 Nira car. Now think about this. This vehicle is not restored, is 97 years old, and it runs. As we see Mark and Bert Richmond pose for a photo, you get to hear this Nira car, and you get to see the flywheel on the back of this 221 cc two-stroke engine, the flywheel that will drive the rear wheel. There I go. Alright. And now we spot Glenn Ukak showing off his Villo Rex, Czechoslovakian built three-wheel cycle car as he explains one of the interesting participants at the street fair in Chicago. And the thing is, it's just the jowl of the ECC engine where they extended the crank shaft so they can put a uh, fan on. It's not getting a lot of air in here. You didn't drive it here, did you? Yes, from Villa Park. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> he rides in in the Toys for Tots parade in the winter. Yeah, a couple times I've been Toys for Tots, and, and I uh, drive it quite a bit. You do? Yeah. Uh, um, how fast does it go? If everything's running well, it's on level ground, no headwind, it can do 55, 60. Yes, we spot my Triumph race bike right next to it. It's an Italian-built Mondial, and Burt Richmond is going to tell us all about this beautiful motorcycle. The motorcycle that we're looking at right now is a 1957 Mondial Sport 200. Mondial was one of the great race bike builders uh, in Italy, and the whole program in Italy, which we Americans learned about, is race on Sunday, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Uh, this is a very unique motorcycle. Uh, when you look at the engine, you'll see what looks like a pair of valve cover adjusters on the right side of the engine, but in fact, those are just dummies, and they added the 200cc just to give it a little bit of style and uh, identification. Uh, do you have any questions for me in terms of what the Mondial is all about? Well, what part of Italy were the factory and uh, they raced Grand Prix back, back in those days? Yes, the factory was actually in Milan, uh, as was the sales department, and that was not unusual to have a sales department 
in Milan because that was considered to be the center of all the activity. Um, but they, it was one of the top 10 brands that consistently won and were very innovative in terms of the design of the bikes and how they came up with their internal engine components. Uh, very lightweight, uh, reducing the reciprocal mass in the crankshaft and connecting rods, but uh, very light flywheel and they went just fine. Super reliable. Other than that, isn't, isn't a lot I can tell you about. In fact, I took a group of 12 people on a ride last December from the northwest part of Argentina down through the Andes Mountains down to Bariloche. So, yes, I'm still riding, including kickstart motorcycles. I like the ones where you just have to push the button, but kickstarting works just fine. Thank you, Bert. And can you believe that over 16,000 of these near cars were built in the 1920s? And now we're going to talk to the owner. Hi, my name is Mark Mate, and uh, I'm from Chicago. And uh, talking about this old crusty bike I've got here, uh, it was made in America around the mid 1920s. It's called a um, Nera car. I always have to get Nera car. And it. Uh, it was sort of uh, designed as a uh, enclosed machine. Right now, it's, it's open, but this metal piece covers up the innards pretty well. And what that gives you is is a machine that is enclosed enough that it was marketed towards uh, women and men working in offices. So it was not uh, not designed as a uh, you know a, a go race hell for the motorcycle. It was more uh, uh, a genteel bike designed for. Uh, I should take that nut off first uh, for someone who didn't want to get the grease and the oil all over them from the bike. And um, uh, I'll have to struggle with this a little bit here. At any rate. Uh, it has an unusual transmission. Probably a good thing I took this back off. Uh, what you've got here is the flywheel it has a polished face here. Uh, this engages this at a 90 degree angle. There is braking surface on here to give it bite. And as I twist this, you can see this whole wheel engage and disengage from the face of that wheel. That's how you get your clutching action to change your gears. You press this button, this moves in and out on the uh, radius of the flywheel to give you different gear ratios. Um, two stroke, this is your kickstart here, right there, and a uh, fairly simple machine. Uh, it does have front suspension, uh, actually torsion bar front suspension. Uh, if you look here, you've got a spring, a pivot point in the arm coming forward. The front hub has a ball joint in it that allows the hub to steer around the actual fixed axle, if you want to call it that. Um, made in the mid 20s to the late 20s in America, and around 1930, it was also made in Britain under license. Uh, the, the British did their a copy of it. So it was originally an American bike, and this is an American made machine. Uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, Chassis. You look at the chassis. There's a C cross, uh, a, a C channel of metal, C shaped, and up here where it's curved to allow the the sweep of the wheel to steer, it's filled with wood. So like an old old cars also use a similar technique of reinforcing C channel frame rails. Uh, obviously, it's an original bike, all crusty and rusty, but it does run. And uh, that's a, oh, oh one more. A little noisemaker. Here we go. <laughs> That's all I got today. Thank you, Mark. As we look at the center hub steering on this Nera car, now we're going to look at a 1968 Velorex 350 motorcycle car 
and we're going to talk to the owner, Glenn Bucat. Hi, I'm Glenn Bukak from Villa Park, Illinois. I own a 1968 Velorex 16350. It's made in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the three-wheeler was originally made for handicapped people, but most people that owned them were not handicapped. Uh, it's a very basic vehicle that um, was manufactured in Czechoslovakia um, with some of it is off-the-shelf parts uh, from their uh, motorcycle industry, uh, Jawa and CZ, and as well as a few Škoda car parts uh, thrown into the mix. I've had it for 17 years. I actually imported it from the Czech Republic. Um, I had it shipped to south of Miami, Florida, and I actually drove it all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, the entire length of the state of Florida, before I put it in a U-Haul and took it home. Interesting feature that it's a, a, a Dyna starter, a starter generator. So basically, uh, I have four speeds forward and four speeds in reverse. I can start it backwards. So what is this here? Was that the air cleaner? Air cleaner, yeah. Oh, man. That would have been under the seat of your motorcycle, right. straight off of the motorcycle. Right, right. And it's a twin, right? Uh, yeah, twin. 350? Uh, 350 cc, two cylinder, two stroke. And what's interesting is it had your typical uh, cable driven uh, clutch actuation. Right. But in the last couple years of the model, they put a slave cylinder off of a Škoda car onto there, and that's actually a hydraulic slave cylinder. Thank you, Glenn. As we look around the show, we spot this 1952 KTM Maribel 150 scooter made in Germany. A great looking scooter. I don't believe I've ever seen one before. And now we're looking at a 1951 Moto Guzzi Aroni single cylinder. It's only a 250, so it's not the Falcon, but it has the exposed flywheel. It's a horizontal single, a gorgeous looking Moto Guzzi, and right next to it is a Moto Guzzi Gelato 192. I don't know what kind of engine this motorcycle has, but you notice there's a spare wheel tucked in the front of the bike. At the rear, the drive sprocket is not attached to the wheel, it's separate, so that spare wheel can be used, I believe, in either front or back. As you look at these two beautiful Italian built Moto Guzzi's, great bikes at this vintage show. There was also a good number of Japanese vintage motorcycles. Here's a 750 three cylinder Kawasaki, a three cylinder 550 Suzuki, and a four cylinder Honda race bike. And I had a chance to talk to Sam Oliva, the owner of these bikes. Hi, I'm Sam Oliva. Um, I collect vintage motorcycles and I brought uh, five or six bikes here to a vintage event at uh, the West Loop. And uh, I'd like to show you some of my bikes today. Okay, tell me about the Kawasaki first. All right, uh, that's a 1972 Kawasaki uh, that was um, it's called it's a model H2 and uh, it was kind of the answer to the Honda who had come out with the 750 in 1969 and that was Kawasaki trying to catch up because Honda had it was so successful with the 69 and uh, they continued making that for about 10 years so that's what that bike is there was a H1 model in 1969, uh, and that one was 500 cc's, but that was the year that Honda came out with the 750 cc, and so everybody wanted the bigger and better and faster bike, and uh, so 
this bike, the H2, was an answer to the H1, the 500cc bike, and, and it went up to the 750. At that time, in the magazines, I think this was the first bike to turn like 11 seconds in the quarter mile stock. Right, right. That was a big, right. and much faster than the Honda. Right. Okay, so then you got this 550 Suzuki. Tell me about that. Uh, the 550 Suzuki is also in 1972, so at that point, Suzuki hadn't come out with a 750. They had to wait a couple more years, and then I believe that they came out with one that is kind of nicknamed a water buffalo, and that 750 uh, is, uh, was the answer, but it was four or five years after Honda had come out with their 750. So uh, they were took them a little bit longer to catch up. In 1969, I would have been 16 years old. So the bikes from before 69, I wasn't, I mean, I had a couple of them, the little ones, but none of the bigger ones. So I started to kind of track the bikes and keep, uh, pay attention to them when I got to be about 16. And uh, so that's why these bikes are kind of prominent and something that I collect. So what was your first street bike? Uh, the first, bike that I purchased was $50. It was a Honda 50 step through and uh, it blew the air through my face at 40 miles an hour and got me, I didn't have to pedal like my bicycle and it was so much fun. But that was my first bike. Now, my second bike I've actually brought here, that was a uh, Honda S65 in 1966. And uh, that's a little red one over there. And uh, that one went maybe 45 or 50 miles an hour, and so that was my next step. And then, systematically, I kind of graduated up into bikes until I was up to a 750. Uh, today, uh, we're looking at uh, one of the bikes that I recently uh, collected. It happens to be a 1990 uh, Honda uh, RC30. It's a 750cc model. Uh, when it came out, uh, it was produced by I believe the race team for Honda and uh, they, uh, it was quite expensive. It probably cost about double what uh, other comparable race bikes would cost at the time. So not many were sold in the United States. I believe there's only about 300 of these bikes sold in the U.S. And uh, now that it's coming up on 30 years old uh, and it's um, starting to become a bit more collectible. And it's a beautiful bike. I love looking at it. I saw a little girl walk up and she ran right to this bike and when a little girl like five years old runs to it and tells her mother, that's the prettiest bike, it's saying something about it. Thank you, Sam. And now I spot this 1976 Yamaha DT400, nicely restored, and I had a chance to talk to the owner, Dan Lotz. My name's Dan Lotz. Uh, old dirt biker and uh, I started to go back in time the new stuff is pretty fast and it seems like I'm getting hurt without even crashing so I started riding the older stuff it's fun to uh, do keeps me busy well tell me about this Yamaha uh, it's a 76 DT 400 and it's probably about 98 percent original Yamaha it's got a lot of power Makes a lot of noise, smokes a little, lifts the front wheel really easy, which makes it a lot of fun to ride. And uh, yeah, I love it. It's one of my favorite motorcycles I've ever owned, and I've owned a bunch. So you, you ride this on the street? Yeah, I ride it almost every day. Uh, yeah, pretty much all year round, as long as it's not too nasty out. And uh, yeah, it's my get around bike. Thank you, Dan, as we spot this gorgeous red MV Augusta. We're going to talk to the owner, Bert Richmond. Another bike I want to show you is this MV Augusta, and I'd like to back up and tell you some of the history of MV Augusta. Really what happened after World War II was that Part of the Marshall Plan said that after we bombed your factory and destroyed everything, it was very important for General George Marshall to help rebuild the economies of the fallen nations. 
So anybody that was building anything of a military nature, and MV Augusta got pressed into service with the de development of helicopters and other military aircraft, they were forbidden from making anything of that nature. So what they started to do was just build motorcycles, mopeds, and scooters. This is a fairly advanced version, and this again is one of those situations of race on Sunday and sell, sell on Monday. So we had a few very famous GP riders, racers, Giacomo Agostini and John Surtees. And one of the things that MV Agusta did was they built two-cylinder engines, three-cylinder engines, four-cylinder engines, and the bigger the engines got, what they discovered was if they lightened the flywheel substantially, they would accelerate quicker. They didn't run very smoothly, but they went like hell. And I met John Surtees a couple of years ago, who was famous because not only was he a motorcycle racer, but he had also gone on to win major motor GP races. So he was a world champion on motorcycles and cars. This bike is interesting. Uh, most motorcycles have a pair of forks that ride up and down, and as you hit a bump on a racetrack, your wheelbase changes. So MV Agusta was aware that an Earl's Fork front end, while more complicated and more expensive, actually never let the wheelbase change at all. So it was more stable at high speed. The other thing that they did with this, is this particular model, is an overhead valve, single cylinder, 165, but they also were trying to figure out how to make the gas tank bigger so it would hold more fuel. And so when you look at this gas tank, you'll understand why it's called a disco volante. That translates into flying saucer. So instead of just making the tank longer and lower to hold more fuel, what they did was the unthinkable. They made it wider by adding a liter and a half of fuel on each side and you get this beautifully sculpted tank that then looks like a flying saucer according to them. And I've been seeking this bike for a long time. I found this in Italy about eight years ago. It's unrestored, it's the way I found it, and it's pretty spectacular. And I do ride this fairly often. Thank you, Bert. And now we spot this Vincent Firefly with a 45cc Vincent built clip-on engine. Not to be confused with the Ferrari Firefly, which is a long range fighter built by the Brits during World War II. It has the Rolls-Royce Riffin engine making 1,735 horsepower. The engine is a V12 that is 2,240 cubic inches. As you can see with this clip-on engine on this Firefly, as you lift the engine, it drives the rear wheel on this uniquely beautiful, restored Vincent Firefly motorbike. Another motorbike at the show is this Monarch with a twin two-stroke engine, and we had a chance to talk to the owner, Mark Matei. I'm Mark Matei, I'm from Chicago. Uh, one of the bikes I brought down today was a Monarch Super Twin, made about 1950-51. Uh, Monarch was a bicycle company uh, out of Chicago. Uh, they made, started making bicycles in the 1930s, uh, and for a couple of years they did a motorized bike. 
What's a little unique about it is it's a two-cylinder, a Pose twin uh, bike with uh, uh, a dry plate clutch on it. It has uh, primary and secondary V-belts and an in-and-out box clutch. Whereas the Wizards, which was their competition, usually most of those had a slipping belt design, except for the automatic ones. Uh, it does have front suspension. Uh, came in several colors. Uh, this particular one, the green and the cream. Uh, and uh, probably sold, I want to say, the retail on it back in the day was maybe $120, $130, something like that. Thank you, Mark, as we spot this Ducati SS, and it has the Desmo valve system on the single cylinder, red and gold Italian built motorcycle. As we look at this BMW, a Benelli, a Guerrera, and a BSA, for more information about the Randolph Street Market, their website is randolphstreetmarket.com. To get hold of Burt Richmond, email him at burt at burtrichmond.com. If you want to contact me, it's teamdan45 at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of this clip, this market. We had a great time showing off great looking vintage motorcycles. And remember, you can always search on YouTube with Dan Schmidt Motorcycle Racing for great motorcycle racing action.